Steve Van Samson, Curtis M. Lawson, Paul Christian Glenn, Joshua Rex, Raz, Rob Snell, Hey everybody, welcome to The Clutch on Sunday. Tonight we have with us um, author Joshua Rex, right over here. Um, coming at us, I, I had to put up the Renaissance man. We have yet another from Providence over on the East Coast who is a historian as well as a songwriter and an artist and a fabulous art author. And uh, we're gonna be talking about his books and uh, his latest stuff that's come out. Oh, there we got Susan. Hey Susan. And uh, yeah, this is this is Joshua Rex, everybody. Uh, he's with Weird House. We saw Curtis Lawson was on before with us, and they both did the Coffin Makers book together. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna show off some swag real quick here because I buy everything from you guys when I can get my hands on it. Um, Y'all probably remember we went through this one before with Curtis, and this was just the lovely detail. Um, Wanted to show it off again because Luke Spooner, who does you guys' artwork, is just amazing. And uh, let's find one of the nice pieces in here. I'm showing this to y'all because you can still get copies of this book if you go onto the Weird House website. Here's some of the beautiful artwork that goes into that. And then you have Joshua's current release, which is New Monsters. And I, of course, had to go and get the autographed numbered copy of this as well. So yay, all my signatures. And once again, beautiful artwork wraparound cover by Luke Spooner. So hi, Joshua. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Thanks for having me, Del. Oh, I was so excited. I love having you guys on because you're all fabulous. Oh, hello, Mike. Nice to have you joining us. Um, so I first got introduced to reading Joshua's stuff by, um, Curtis, because I was following him for some things. And after reading the Coffin's Makers, Coffin Makers Book of Dark Tales, that is a mouthful, by the way, um, <laughs> I had to start reading more. And so I've read, read all of New Monsters. I have Inamorta lined up and ready, waiting for me to go into next. And, um, I just... I love the way you write. You have, you can tell that you're a musician because the way that you weave some of your stories has a definite rhythm to it. And there's some musical elements that flow through a lot of it. Um, and I'm a heavy dreamer and I feel like you pull a lot of things out of your dreams as well, where it has that feel to me where the, where it's kind of broken up, but it all makes sense together. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for, for, for reading and, uh, you know, for reading so diligently and, uh, and, you know, all the kind comments. Um, I, you know, some things I have a hard time with dreams because, uh, you know, I'll have dreams. We all have them. I think where you have an idea for something or something seems especially filmic, maybe in a certain one, but as soon as I wake up, they're vanished to the point where, mm. I don't, I'm, they're gone and I, I don't really have a grasp on them there. I think there probably have been some stories here or there where they are dream influence, but uh, generally I got to fill in a lot of gaps. Even if I have a skeleton of something, uh, it really just kind of takes on its own form by the end of whatever it is, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I grab my dreams, but I guess that's why I think when I see people's writing, I'm always like, Oh, that's like a dream that I had or something. <laughs> I, I need to, I didn't read the thing ahead of time. Um, there's a ticker that I wanted to run and I don't know where it went. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, need people to comment so that, cause I'm giving away merch so that you can get your hands on some of Josh's stuff. Two people are going to be getting autographed versions like the book that I had that I just showed you. And I will be giving away some e-copies as well. Um, so, okay, so you don't do the dream thing, but the one that, there's a story that I want to talk about real quick with, in the book that you just released in New Monsters, and this is the one that was exactly like, I was like, I've been there in my dreams too, I know where you're at, and, um, it was, like, death in the present tense, 
mm. which I, I, I've i also noticed, and I don't know if you know this or not, you talk a lot about death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in your, there, there's, a, there's a lot of death in your stuff, but it's mm -hmm. not like over, it, you're able to keep it fresh as you go through each one. It's not just mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, somebody's going to die. It's like, ooh, how's this? Oh, wow. That's <laughs> neat. I see what you did there. <laughs> but that one, um, you have people, uh, he's also a historian, boys and girls, I think I mentioned that. So so he knows things. And in that particular story, they're, um, the main character is going through different mausoleums and different grave sites in, in kind of weird places and things are moving around and stuff as he goes through them. And I, I've had dreams before where I'm like in cemeteries and, that I'm like, there are specific ones where like people are acting out their last moments over and over and over again, or you do have to follow different things and things move on. Mm. So was a lot of that, um, what was that one based on? Where'd you get the different ideas for the different types well, of I'm... grave settings that there were? Cause there were a couple different sets of places in the different graveyards. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, I had uh, written a collection of, uh, quote, death stories, I guess you call them. And uh, initially, I had wanted to publish them just with a totally black cover, so nothing on it whatsoever. And then you open it, and there's a table of contents, and just to be real simple. Um, but it turned out that when I, when I finished the manuscript, this was several years ago, I didn't really care for how it came out. I, I thought a lot of the stories needed a lot of work. and. Uh, there were a few though that that I still really did like and wanted to explore some more. I guess I just didn't feel like I quite had the skill to do them the way I wanted to do them, and Death in the Present Tense was one of them. And so when I revisited it, uh, I still, you know, like I said, I still liked the theme. I still liked how it was moving. Uh, I still liked the protagonist and the and the notion of it. But uh, I I just kind of came at it at a different angle, and that is one of those things where. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I think the more you write, the the better your eye gets for. Uh, what's happening in the story and how to tell it and how to visualize some of the things. And uh, that one, you know, it just sort of moves on. The main character is walking along this trail that he discovers uh, through this sort of wooded area that uh, leads off from a parking lot uh, from a subway platform. And anyway, so he finds himself on this trail and uh, finds this cemetery. And he thought he had visited all the cemeteries in the area. He's sort of obsessed with death. And so when he finds the cemetery, he starts walking through and he sees these tombs, but they're tombs that sort of feel like frozen life or frozen death, I guess, if you were, where there are mausoleums, but they have smoke coming out of the chimneys. Um, there's a girl that's sort of frozen in a hospital gown, sort of on a bridge in between a tomb. And so I just started to think about these notions of moments of uh, what, you know, what if our mausoleums really looked like our ends, really looked like what they were. Uh, you could have kind of froze that moment in time. And I think it would say a lot more than the simple gravestone does itself or some of the way that the uh, tributes do, you know, with marble angels and such. Uh, and and also, of course, it feeds back to the notion of this protagonist being obsessed with death and, uh, uh, and, and the whole idea of, you know, death being something that can be present, but it's generally thought of as, you know, the after or something after. Um, so I was kind of fascinated to think about what that would mean if you were to actually put that together, uh, go to a cemetery that showed it sort of present, even if it's in a frozen state. I hope that's uh, explaining it well enough <laughs> to, to, to make that oh. uh, visually clear. <laughs> yeah, it. You, you guys, you have to read this because it is just everything is so beautiful and you can really picture what's going on in your mind. You're a very visual storyteller. And it's just great. And I'm, I'm going to jump into another story real quick. I'm going to go back to the Coffin's, Coffin Maker's Book of Dark Tales. I'm going to get that right soon. I, <laughs> I love that one constantly. But I love the book. Um, and, I, and I know that this is probably the one you get talked to a lot about. But um, the governess story. Mm -hmm. um, with the, it's, it's this beautiful story about uh, these children who are terrors and trying to scare off a governess and a new governess comes in and I was wondering what inspired that one because it, it, it's really dark really fast and it's awesome <laughs> well thank you uh, uh Agnes Gray by Anne Bronte uh it was uh, sort of 
sort of a, uh, I guess you'd call it a loose uh, personal uh, account of her time as a governess in the 1840s for this uh, really terrible family. Uh, and they, these children in this, you know, it's, it's a, it's a piece of fiction. So the children in the story just really abuse her. And, and you really get the sense that Anne's speaking firsthand on this uh, from prior experience. And uh, I was so furious with those children by the end of that book, <laughs> I just had to make a story where they got their comeuppance <laughs> to use a British term. And uh, that's where that came from. And uh, that, that one was a lot of fun because the, I don't remember where the idea came from for Mrs. Peels herself, but she was she was a blast to write. She's she's sort of a creature feature. A lot of those coffin maker stories are kind of creature features, at least my end of it. Um, I think Curtis's a lot of them are a lot more eloquent than mine. Um, but uh, yeah, that one that one was a lot of fun to write. And going back to that period, you know, that sort of um, I guess in, in that story, it's more sort of a later late Victorian uh, rather than mid Victorian. Uh, but it still feels 19th century in the telling, I think. Yeah, that's, mm. I love, that's the, I, I wrote a governess story once, but your governesses all have to be about that, that same era. Because mm -hmm. we don't have a governess anymore. You have a nanny or an au pair or something, but. Um, yeah, I suppose it's implied. That's, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. But um, we were just, <clears throat> forgive me. We were just talking before we came on about um, the dreams in the La Furman house, and you said that was based on your experiences. So I thought that was really cool. So I wanted you to be able to tell our viewers about that one too. Sure. Uh, yeah, I did a internship in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, at a place called Black Point Estate and Gardens. And uh, the director of that site, Dave De Simone, he's he's a really good buddy of mine. Been for years. Uh, back when I was a painter, gave me my first solo show. Uh, he's just been a, a really wonderful influence in so many ways on my art life. Uh, he's a great guy to, to just speak with on all sorts of levels, all sorts of things. Uh, great traveler and such. So we had a lot of adventures while I was there uh, doing my internship, and and I was there uh, essentially researching uh, the textiles collection at Black Point, uh, so a lot of Victorian clothing. And I was also doing a project on the year 1871 for a presentation at the Lake Geneva Public Library and such. Uh, for a little context, that estate was built in 1888 and uh, it was for a, a beer baron named uh, Conrad Sype. So it's this big summer house on the lake. And uh, during all our ramblings, my buddy Dave and I kind of came up with this character, Ezra Furman. We visited this mine and we were down in this mine and uh, it was just sort of a riot. At one point, the guy was down there with a candle and she blew out the candle and we realized we're just in this mine by ourselves. Uh, we're not by ourselves, but with the, with the other group. And, you know, and, and turn out the guide was like 16 and like she had been leading tours for like two weeks. And so we were just kind of hysterical thinking, well, we're going to die. And, you know, it was just a great, uh, a great adventure. And at that museum, there was some weird story about some guy that had like white chocolate and lead or something. And and there was something about these kids dipping their paint, their fingers in the paint and eating the lead. And anyway, there was this whole little like mythology that came up around this character, Ezra Furman, that we just kind of made up. And uh, so I kind of used him for the uh, villain in the story. But more deeply, uh, it's really about uh, Ezra Furman in the story is this, this sort of mass murderer uh, with his wife or serial killer. And, and, you know, so this museum and that story is about him and preserving him and preserving his clothing and his legacy and all that. And there's an intern and director, again, loosely based on sort of my experiences with Dave in the story. And uh, and so the intern's doing this historic uh, clothing research. But uh, there's this haunted vest sort of thing that keeps appearing. It's showing up. And uh, there's some uh, research finds that this is uh, there's blood on it and that it's not from the Furman family. And, uh, you know, not to give it all away, but, you know, things start to happen where you start to realize that uh, there's something going on with the, some of the people that uh, Furman killed. And then on a, on a very, very broad notion, uh, looking at, you know, who do we remember when we talk about these sorts of places, these sort of historic houses? Uh, what's this notion of celebration or commemoration? Uh, you know, should we be uh, in, in some instances? 
you know, should, should we be telling, uh, should we be telling a more rounded history about uh, some, what some of these people have done, and uh, you know, how do, how we do we contextualize that again with um, you know the broader notion of in, in this case crime and that. Uh, so that that was that story was fun on a lot of levels. It also involved my work as a historian, so I thought that was great. And uh, it's it's a little different than some of the other stories in New Monsters, but I think uh, Furman definitely fits in as a monster. I, I hope you found so too, though. <laughs> Oh yeah, I I love the whole thing with the um, the history that I don't want to go way too off because I don't want to get anybody. I don't know how comfortable you are talking about it with the way people are these days. But my personal thing is that um, there are very bad people in history, and we need to recognize that and not necessarily woohoo, yay, they lived. But hey, look, that guy lived, and people respected him and went out of their way to do things for him. And he was a monster. And we have to remember that we let people become the monster and still celebrate them. But we don't have to necessarily celebrate them today, but we have to remember that monsters can make it all the way up to the top of the society. And and nobody did a damn thing about it and didn't look badly on them until we're in our present day. And we're like, well, well, we don't need to talk about that person. It's like, yes, yes, we need to talk about that person because otherwise there's just going to be another one and another one and another one. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think, and because they used to bring children out to executions to just show them also mm -hmm. that, and yes, you can also destroy the monster. Mm -hmm. I think was mostly behind that. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think that. You know, I mean, as an historian, you, you really start to understand that there really aren't heroes and villains in history, that you have people and that history is extraordinarily complex. You have to put things in context with the era, uh, but you have to tell the truth. It's the most important obligation you have. And, and in my view, you have to tell the best objective truth of what's going on uh, to your ability. It's not always easy to tell those stories. Sometimes you don't have a lot of evidence. You do the best you can. Uh, but certainly, I mean, you know, in, in the museum, I work at the work uh, that I do deals with uh, someone who dealt in the slave trade, made a lot of money off the slave trade. And so it's about telling the full story about, uh, you know, what he was involved in, uh, you know, as as well as him being a big uh, proponent of, you know, the American Revolution and, and you know, helping to win liberty and such. Uh, so, you know, again, it, it's about telling the whole story and, and not really, in my view, to not, you know, pointing fingers and saying, you know, this is a hero, this is a villain. A lot of times it's about uh, people doing really bad things. And, um, but again, it's, it's not about hiding any of that stuff. Uh, and so, uh, yes, to, you know, to your point, it, it needs to be done. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in that, in that regard with, uh, I think, uh, a lot of histories. Um, but I think that um, people are reckoning with that and working toward, uh, you know, telling a more complete story. Yeah, I quick side note on that. Uh, the one that really bothered me was I, I got taken on a fabulous haunted history tour by an exceptionally educated man um, named Andrew. And I'm forgetting, you know, forget his last name. But um, anyway, it was down in New Orleans and he took us to all the different places and explained histories and when he took us to Jackson Square this was still when the statue was up and he kind of got everybody's opinions on you know what do you know about Andrew Jackson and they were just like oh you know he old hickory he did this and he did this and then he's like okay and then what do you know about the tale of tears and what do you know about the executions that were held here in this square and like describing everything and and he was um actually he was born in like Poland and been in all these other places and was now living in New Orleans working on uh, his dissertation. But it was having somebody who wasn't even from America originally suddenly giving us an education in our history and made everybody go like, oh, well, I didn't know about that. They don't, they don't really talk about that too much in high school. Or if they do, they gloss it over so much that, you know, and now that's, that's something that's gone. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I get you know, people don't want to be like, oh, we're looking up to him. But it's just like, but still, you have to remember him. Because even though he was everybody's old hickory and did all these wonderful, fun things that we all remember, we have to remember the dark side, too. Absolutely. And he was president. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, definitely. Uh, one of the things I talk about the museum I work at is uh, the fact that, you know, we always learn about slavery in the South, but it was pervasive all through the North and in New England, and particularly in Rhode Island, it really underpinned the, the economy, uh, especially as it had to do with sugar, uh, which is sort of the fuel for the triangle trade that's going to Africa, to the West Indies and back up to Rhode Island, where the sugar is being used to make rum, uh, rum being the major export going to Africa to trade for enslaved people. So, uh, you know, over a thousand ships leave Rhode Island alone, transfer a hundred thousand enslaved people to the, the Americas. So you have uh, aspects of that, that uh, a lot of people will come in to the museum and oh, I had no idea that this was here. And so again, you know, th this is something that I think uh, is becoming more well known and, uh, you know, broadening the, the notion of what it is. And one of the things we talk about is how, uh, you know, everyone at the time, even if they weren't necessarily owning enslaved people or trading in them, they were still complicit because they're making maybe the sales for the ships or their farmers sending crops down to feed these people in the West Indies that are cutting the sugar cane. Uh, but we also then, uh, I, I especially like to tie it to today, how we still support, there's still five, uh, 50 million enslaved people in the world in different trades. Uh, you know, everything from literal chattel slavery to, uh, you know, people in the, that, are, that are forced into sex slavery and such. And so there's a wide range of it. And, uh, but, you know, the clothing that we wear, a lot of that's produced uh, by uh, enslaved hands. We don't see it, but it's still going on in the country. So this notion of complicity is still with us, too. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not easy to talk about. It's not easy to reckon with, but it's just important to keep in mind. And I think it also helps put in the context that notion of reliability and what we what we need to do, what we're forced to do, because we don't really have any other options. Right. We have very few options. Not all of us can afford to buy, uh, you know, uh, American made clothing because it's extraordinarily expensive. <laughs> it can be $60 for a pair of yeah. shorts or something. So, uh, again, not to go on a big history lesson, but um, just to provide some. You know, oh, I love history. Some of that. Um, so, it, yes, uh, you know, again, I think uh, you're right on point with that. Um, you know, and Jackson is just kind of one of those figures that, you know, the whole story needs to be told. Yeah, he, he's one of the very polarizing ones, I think, for America. New Orleans itself is just a bastion of history. I love going down there, but I need to get out to Portland and um, Portland, Providence. I keep getting those two. <laughs> Portland, Maine's beautiful too, actually. <laughs> get up to Portland too. <laughs> but, yeah, I have a friend who lives there, so I get everything all goofed up. Um, I just want to go hit the East Coast and spend like a month kind of slowly going through state by state because it, it's all very close together. So mm -hmm. I could have a good time. And I think that as soon as you move into Providence, they automatically pull you aside, don't they? And train you up. If you don't already have like four artistic capabilities, you have to <laughs> learn that before you're allowed to live there. I, for it everybody that I've talked to. It's creative capital. It does tend to attract a lot of artists. And uh, yeah, it, it's a wonderful place to be. I think Rhode Island you know, I mean, I've lived in Connecticut. I've lived in Mass. Uh, you know, I grew up partly in Mass when I was younger. Uh, I think Rhode Island is the gem of New England by far uh, that I've experienced. Uh, you know, Massachusetts has its attractions. Connecticut, too. Of course, you know, New Hampshire, Vermont, the beauty in all of these places. But Rhode Island is, I think, the little secret uh, and province in particular. It's just there's not a city like it. It's just remarkable. I'm going to have to go visit that. We, My mother... Um, found some place, I'm not going to name it because I don't want to badmouth them, but um, down in Alabama that she, she wants to have a little vacation house in the South. And then she was like, I'll just rent one. It's, it's easier than trying to maintain a property when I'm not there. But she found this small town that was like, Oh, it's an author's paradise. We have all these book signings and all these local authors live here and thrive. And they went to it. She took my niece and we were just like, there was nothing there. It was really run down. In the places that were and nothing was open, you know, on the weekends they closed. Apparently they only do their signings and stuff during the week, which mm. that doesn't make sense. And so we're just like, okay, so that one's out. So I'm like, okay, so we're going further north, further north. And she's like, I don't want snow. I want <laughs> art. <laughs> well, you know, weirdly, right. Providence doesn't really seem to have much snow. I don't, I don't know why. I mean, of all the years I've oh. lived here, I've seen only a handful of snowstorms. I, I don't know. I mean, I think of the ocean's part of it, you know, the way it's kind of situated. Uh, but, but yeah, wow. You know, I mean, talk about bookstores here. There was one that, uh, really broke my heart this year, Seller Stories that closed. It's called Seller Stories, but it was upstairs. 
Uh, it had been there for God over 40 years and it was just a magical place. I used to go there and get all my early, uh, Anne Rice first editions of the vampire Chronicles when I was like 19. Um, uh, but it was just a great store and they had actually, I held a, a Lovecraft book there. One, one that was in his, uh, that he actually owned and had written his name in. Uh, they had a few for sale there. I think, well, actually, I think they only had two anyway, they had one that had just come in and, um, the woman was showing it to me behind the counter and. And I said, may I hold that? <laughs> she said, sure. So she handed it to me. I was just like, wow, I was holding this book that Lovecraft held. It was amazing. Um, because, you know, his all his papers are at the John Hugh Library by Brown. And and all you can look at are facsimiles now because I guess they're getting so frayed from all the use. But um, that was amazing. And that's something that, you know, you feel it can only happen in Providence. Uh, and I mean, there's even a Lovecraft Arts and Science, uh, a whole bookstore for dark fiction, you know, right in the center of the city. And you walk in there and it's just a who's who of writing contemporary stuff. And also, you know, of course, many, many, many successful authors and, you know, even back to Poe and such. So, uh, yeah, Providence is just loaded with, you know, great people, great bookstores. You got to get up here. Uh, yeah. I, my, we used to have this great bookstore over in Omaha that... Um, it's just called the Antiquarium, and it in the basement there was a record store. On the main two floors there were books that went all the way to the back, and then there was an upper story that had an art gallery in it. So you kind of go up to the second floor, and then there was another little section up above, and it had the and he'd have like once a month new art displays on. But he kept a bunch of chairs in a circle when he entered the store, and he'd be sitting there barefoot, smoking a cigarette, doing his crossword puzzle had coffee pot going all the time and people just join around um, Tom Rudloff and chat. And he spoke like 10 different languages. So whenever anybody who came in uh, the town that spoke a different language would be coming, he'd be introduced to them. They'd be like, Oh, if you want to practice, cause he wanted to practice maintaining languages then he would help them get their English down. So mm -hmm. it, it wasn't unusual to have a conversation going around with like three or four different languages being spoken. Oh, which was really fun. Yeah. It it was fabulous. And they ended up a health and stuff eventually caught up with him and he had to close down the bookstore port bookstore part and went to a one that's a little bit smaller where they there's a smaller city here where we have a bunch of like it seems like everybody who has a good bookstore has a smaller sister site there. And so he went to the smaller bookstore and then ended up passing away and it was just like, oh my God. So mm. but they're those bookstores, you walk in and time just stops, mm -hmm. you know, you can mm -hmm. just, I, I, the, the power of all the words going on just somehow makes time dilate down until you can just kind of, it's. It, yeah, it's a great observation. There's a library here called the Providence Athenaeum that uh, was built in the 1830s. And uh, Poe actually used to court Sarah Helen Whitman there. It was a poet that lived on the road and there was big dramas with, this was after Virginia died, so big drama about uh, his wife, Virginia, I should say. Um, and a big drama about him uh, courting her and drunkenness and uh, the famous portrait of him, the Ultima Thule, uh, where he looks really drawn and hang dog and he's got the black circles under his eyes. That was actually taken uh, on the site of another library called the uh, Rhode Island School Design Fleet Library, where I do a lot of work. I was doing some research and found out that it was, the building used to literally be on that site. So that was weird to think about that. Um, you know, that he had tried to kill himself and uh, took some laudanum, went to Boston, and he ended up coming back. Uh, he threw up the laudanum, came back, and then uh, four days later, he took, uh, they took this picture of him and he said it was probably the lowest point of his life. Uh, so anyway, all this was going on at that time, and it was a lot of this was happening at that Providence Athenaeum at this library. And they have a uh, book where he wrote his name uh, in it under a poem that had been uh, printed as anonymous. And I think it was a Godey's. I may be wrong on that, but I think that's what it was. Uh, but anyway, it, it's just creaking floors of books. And, and it's just like what you said. You feel the words surround you. And then you have all these classical busts, of course, looking at you. One of them being Poe uh, right at the entrance. And then there's a raven and a bell jar and all this stuff. So um yeah, it's an incredible library, uh, but yeah, I definitely feel that notion of what you mentioned there. Yeah, I have a friend who works at um, the Edgar Allan Poe House off and on. She volunteers there, and she sent me a print of that picture. She had redrawn it or whatever, but yeah, mm -hmm. I gave it to my daughter for her graduation present because she was a big Poe fan. Oh, that's so. great. The one in Virginia? Is it the Poe Museum of Virginia? I believe so. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, I actually um, did an interview on my podcast with the with the director, the curator there, Chris Sentner, and he was a wonderful guy to talk to. They have such a great poke collection; it's amazing. <laughs> what is your podcast cover? I, I that's one thing I didn't get into. Oh well, I talk to uh, artists, authors, uh, musicians, historians. Uh, so pretty broad range of of artists, and of course the historians. You know, I got I got to talk to them too. Um, but you know, generally that and. Uh, if I if I read a book by a contemporary author, I'll reach out to you know him or her and see if I can uh, get him on the po podcast. Uh, I just really enjoy that sort of thing. When a book really strikes you, and then you can talk, uh, you know, one on one with somebody. It's it's a, it's a real thrill. Oh yeah, I love picking the brains. <laughs> Doing a little bit of that right now. That's why I have my crows <laughs> sweeping down. On the thing. It's like I'm going after your head. I'm gonna go through ah, the eye. I have okay, to. Okay. I will get it. Um. I am not going to even try to find my handwriting right now, but when you're talking about holding the book that Lovecraft wrote, uh, I think it was in the coffin makers book. Was that, wasn't that a story that you had written about the guy who finds the notebook, the black book of nothings? I oh, that was Curtis. Oh, is that Curtis? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's a great story. This reminded me of a similar idea of being like, I get to touch the book that this person had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good story, yeah. Curtis. By the way. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a that's a fabulous story, and uh, yeah, the, the feeling would, <laughs> I think the feeling would be sort of like what that what that pro tag felt. Sure. <laughs> uh, I yeah, I when you get to hug history, and that's what, I, if I get something like that, I just have to like give it a nice hug, and then I bubble wrap it all up nice, and maybe give it a sniff or two before I do that. But that's just <laughs> my thing. Then I put them all away so that they stay safe and happy. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't get too many going back. I did once at that bookstore I was telling you about uh, get a first edition copy of Naked Lunch, which mm -hmm. was just odd because I I had been talking about it with a friend and I noticed it in the cabinet. I didn't even realize that he had it there, not just for display purposes, but because it was a first edition. And this is before I was smart about books besides, you know, about collectibles anyway. And so I got it and I was like talking to my friend. He's like, this is a first edition. And I'm like, okay, I spent 20 bucks on it. He's like, you what? <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's amazing. I yeah. ordered a uh, book by, uh, it's called Are You Loathsome Tonight by uh, Poppy Z. Bright. And, you know, this is one of those, I, I just got the Poppy Z. Bright, so I just, of course, was ordering everything because, um, well, you know, he, Billy Martin, you now is just amazing. Uh, but I remember it came in the mail, and it was signed by Poppy and Caitlin Kiernan and Peter Strom and the artist. It was this limited edition run, and it was just sort of one of those moments like, like that <laughs> where you're going, oh, my gosh, <laughs> this is... This is much uh, much more amazing than I expected it to be. I had no idea that this this is what would come. <laughs> yeah, I one of these days. Well, hopefully not anytime soon. But when I pass on down, my uh, my nephew is fighting for. We're already talking about when I die, because I have like all my bookcases are full with the like here's the row of books and then here's the row of books in front of them. And then here are the books on top of them stacked. And then, you know, here's the stacks over here and the boxes stuck away in the closet. And so he's claiming first dibs on everything I have that's signed and, and that's cool, I guess. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so you're going to end up with my nephew eventually, by the way, <laughs> so, you know, Fantastic. because you're part of the cool work. It'll oh. be when I'm dead, but you know, oh. Sure, be in good hands. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I started him off well. We were, it was <laughs> like little kid who's reading. I was that little kid who yeah, I didn't need any friends in elementary school because I had my books. Mm -hmm. I was just always reading. And he, he was that way as well. And so it was like, OK, as soon as you're old enough to get into chapter books, here's some Ray Bradbury. All right. We got you started, right? Eventually we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get to the Lovecraft and stuff. But you don't want to start that too young you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, but he's, mm -hmm. he's turned out to be really, really, really artistic and 
everything. Um, yeah. So speak, and, and he's also a musician. And speaking of that, you do um, your music. If you guys, um, by the way, want to know, I have all of his links basically in one. Um, it'll be above or below wherever you're at um, in the in the description um, to your website, and that has links to your artwork, your music, and everywhere your stuff can be found, books and everything. Um, but your music is really awesome. It's very, very dark for one thing. And I love just the feel because it, it, it's not like songs. It's just, it's got its own, it's very experimental, but do you record every part yourself? Yeah. And, uh, um, the, the album specifically, well, I have a couple of things I think on my website, I have a project that's from 2010 that was called Trans Atlas. Uh, that I, it was a two piece band with a, a buddy of mine, uh, Ben Fox, who was a phenomenal drummer. That's really the best of reason to listen to those songs is the drums are just incredible in that. Um, but the record that I have on there that's on Bandcamp that I'm sort of featuring right now on my site is called Decomposer. And uh, those songs, I think I wrote them all between the ages of 24 and 26. So it's been, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm 43. So it's been, a, they've, they've been around a long time. Um, and I had them in different iterations of albums and different forms and such for, for a while. And I was kind of, you know, self-releasing stuff and selling things at shows. I, I, I did music primarily from the age of about like, I don't know, 14 to 20, 25, 26. And then I started painting seriously. So, um, so th those songs are, again, they're, they're, they're older, but what I did is last year, I was thinking about them because I always liked them. And I wanted to uh, see about, now that I had like, you know, modern editing capabilities that, you know, things are basically just right on my laptop where I could easily do all this stuff and, and you know, make it really hi-fi where I couldn't before. Um, you know, back when I was doing this, it was a lot of four track tapes and, you know, things just didn't sound really great. Uh, so I was able to go back and I started listening to them and, and I thought I, I like a lot of this, but I I want to I want to sort of bring it up to how I feel now or artistically what I feel like uh, reflects my my mood or stylings now. So I chopped up a lot of it and I threw a lot of things in reverse and I slowed things down and um, I took old samples of things and and, and twisted them all around and then uh, I ended up with that album and. Uh, it's it's uh, yeah it's it's really bizarre uh but I, I really do like it i think it came out it came out how i wanted it to and uh i feel good about the songs i've always been a little self-conscious of my voice because i don't think i really have a very good voice um but uh i think you know all in all i, th I think the recordings came out pretty well and and uh decomposer uh the the title the title sort of worked on a couple levels i i thought about when i did this record that I thought, okay, well, maybe I can be a quote horror musician or something. And you know, what does that actually mean? And then, so the whole idea of decomposing was, of course, great. Uh, but then the idea of uh, breaking down these songs, these old songs, and uh, making them into something new uh, was kind of fascinating too in that realm. And the cover of it was uh, an interesting story too, because it's this weird red moth thing and uh, or mothy looking creature. And uh, just a quick little aside, my uh, brother Jordan took me to Mothman country in uh, West Virginia before I moved out to Providence. And uh, we went out to the, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this Mothman is this, this supposed creature that uh, was, uh, I don't know if you call it haunting or whatever this, this town in West Virginia. And there's this whole idea that it's maybe comes from this government experiment or it's you know comes out of this field where there are these chemicals that have been dumped in this area called tnt which is strange it was a military armament storage or something and uh anyway so we went to mothman country went to the museum and then he took me out to tnt which is this area where i think the first people saw this mothman thing flying over them over their car and they're trying to get away from it and uh there are all these like, weird bunkers uh, where they were storing these guns and things and ammunition and uh so we went in one of them and the whole area is really strange it's very overgrown the water uh there's this weird sort of still stagnant river area and it's it's just totally still and apparently there's still all kinds of chemicals and stuff out there even though it's like this park area i guess but anyway we went in one of these bunker things 
and it sounds like you're in a nightmare. Like you go in and your voice echoes. It's this cylindrical chamber and it's really dark except for this hole in the top where light comes through. And so it's this intensely echoing thing. And it just feels like this must be like what hell's like, what sound in hell is like. Cause you can't like your footsteps echo and it shuffles your words and everything. It's like sound all fighting with each other. Um, and uh, there it is. And so yeah. as we're walking around, uh, we see this really, really spooky, bizarre figure that someone had spray painted. And that thing is life size. Uh, and it was a lot darker than that when we saw it. And it was just kind of on this wall and it, it sort of spooked us. And then so I took this picture of it with flash and then uh, I didn't really do much editing to that. That's just kind of how it sort of came out. Uh, so I apologize if there's any copy infringement on the uh, artist who did that. I'm guessing it's been there probably since the 70s. <laughs> uh, I, if you're I think there, it was. <laughs> yeah, if you're out there, I'm happy to credit you on the album. But um, but uh, anyway, that's that's where that came from. And that was uh, I just thought that that was a perfect cover for that. It, that is very cool. And we're going in um, when you're talking about your paintings. I just grabbed one of your paintings because it reminded me of the story we were talking about before with the graves. Um, and yeah. I was wondering, was this inspired by that? Is that part of, or uh, is I it just something else you're doing? Th this was a series called Urban Monoliths. And uh, it's a, it was a cemetery in the center of Cleveland, uh, right by uh, what was, what's the, the baseball field, progressive field or whatever it's called now, uh, where the Guardians play, formerly the Indians. And, uh, and you know, the name of the cemetery is slipping my mind and I can't believe it. Um, but anyway, it's a cemetery in the center of the city and it's where the earliest inhabitants uh, of Cleveland are buried, as far as the earliest European inhabitants. Uh, and there are all these stones, uh, a lot of them like this in this state, and uh, I was I was just thinking, I was walking through there one day and just thinking, you know, sort of just how sad it is that these are sort of kind of kicked over like that and kind of look like broken bodies that have just stumbled over or whatever. And uh, so that's where I got the idea for uh, Urban Monolith. So I did a series of 12 of these paintings in black and white. Uh, some of them are a little washier uh, than that one. Uh, though I, I did some that were sort of more Rothko-y looking and then some that or really clean like that and just sort of austere. And uh, and then a, a, a colleague of mine, a, a brilliant photographer, his name's Greg Ruffing, he, uh, he did a series alongside uh, where he essentially took these pictures of different areas in Cleveland where he was from and around the area. And then he developed the prints and we went and buried them in these different areas where he'd taken the pictures. And then later on, we went like two weeks later and we dug them up and then they were in all sorts of different states of decay in that. And so then we took them and presented them as they were, you know, just clean them off to the best we could. Uh, but it was a really interesting show. Um, it was it was dark. It was very death heavy and, you know, and this notion of decay. But I thought that it really paralleled well. Uh, but anyway, that's sort of a, a long winded version of our explanation oh. of that, that piece. <laughs> that's fine. We like long. We like talking. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just fascinated. You're very good at everything that you do. And it's, it just amazes me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I love talking to people who are multi-talented and who have a vocabulary and things. That's something else I've noticed. Y'all, you, you're another one of the ones with the $10 words that <laughs> pop in there every now and then. I think I, I think I did have to look up two words when I was reading your book. I'm, I, I pride myself on my vocabulary, but I was like, I have <laughs> well, thank you. I, I think the, I know, I know uh, a lot of people, well, I, I know there's this sort of debate with writing simply or writing, uh, you know, you should always use the, the $5 word or the 50 cent word instead of the whatever word. Um, I'm not a proponent of that. I, I don't believe in using language to try to showboat or, you know, fancy things up or put, you know, a fancy dress on a, a word or, or on a story or whatever. But I think that uh, going back to what you were saying in the beginning about musicality in uh, in writing, I think that utilizing these words, utilizing these language, uh, this this kind of language uh, can really amp things up and make things more fluid and make things sound more eloquent 
and uh, can also make them more impactful. And sometimes it's literally the meaning of the word that's needed. That's that's a necessity. I find uh, I, I find that the, maybe some of those some of these you know, quote expensive words they tell the story better and they sound better. And I like reading things out loud when I'm writing. I'm always reading them out loud to hear how they sound. And I, I like to write the I like to write things that I want to read. Uh, and I don't like to necessarily read in short clipped things that, that can be effective. And I've, you know, I've done that sort of thing in the past. If the story calls for it, sure. Uh, but I find that at least, you know, my ethos or my personal styling or my, I don't know, my, my just general feeling, my gut feeling on it is that, uh, a, I really like to use the words because I think they're beautiful words. And, and when, especially when they have uh, specific meanings tied to them, like I'm saying, I think you should insert them. Uh, and also, again, the musicality of it, the way it flows, the way it can make the other words sound, the way it can affect and color and sort of flood in uh, to to the sentence itself can be really effective. Um, if you do it, you know, several words over and over and over and over, you're bludgeoning someone and it, I think you get it get incoherent. But if you use them correctly, uh, you know, and, and maybe sparingly, uh, maybe not. But, you know, generally, if you're using them kind of sparingly. I think it can really uh, add to the the beauty and floridity of of, uh, of the piece itself. Oh, very much. I there's a project, and I might get in touch with you if you don't mind. Um, that I'm working on that we're going to be doing a sh like a showcase on at some point in the future. Um, right before Leonard Cohen died, in the last interview that he did, he brought up what he called the landscape of language because people were asking him, "Well, you're not a religious man, but..." you wrote hallelujah, you wrote, you want it darker. You have all of these religious themes, you know, going in the stranger song and he's just some Joseph looking for a manger. And you know, where, where does this come from? And he was like, well, it's how I was raised in the language that I was presented. And it's affects how you think and how you speak and how you fill everything in. And as you grow up, you know, you have the choice of, am I going to expand my vocabulary? You know, what direct, what am I interested in? And, your vocabulary goes around that. If you become a nurse, you're going to be speaking a lot of weird Latin and driving your kids nuts and stuff. But if, you know, <laughs> but the way it goes into your work as you progress, you can see, yeah, it's, it's not like I'm using this word because I want to talk down to you. It's because this is the word that it is. I, I'm not going to give you 20 words explaining it when I can give you one. And yeah, so I very, very good point there. Uh, sometimes that one larger word can really say a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's that's another great point. Um, uh, there was another point uh, going off what you were saying there. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, about speaking of Cohen and, and religion and that, uh, the, what, probably the greatest influence uh, me as, a, as, as a, maybe as an artist is Emily Dickinson. And uh, her work has that what they call the hymn meter, yeah, because you know she was even though she you know, sort of rebelled against uh, a specific uh, you know religious following. Uh, you know she she didn't really adhere to any specific church. Uh, she was certainly Christian as far as she read the Bible and understood it thoroughly and loved the Book of Revelations, etc. And you can see there's influence of of uh, of the Bible in her work. Uh, but you can definitely see that meter. Sometimes her work reads as what you think of as like maybe free verse, free verse. But when you start counting it, you see that she's actually using uh, these meter, these methods, and um, you know, sort of again getting back to that notion of like if you're singing a song, she's sort of ascribing to that. Uh, and yeah, the, the influence of right. I think early on, whatever you're doing can certainly permeate that. Uh, you know, I mentioned Anne Rice earlier. Her uh, the florid use of language definitely influenced me. And I think it's also interesting that she didn't have an editor. Uh, she, I think she did for an interview with the vampire and they sort of changed the notion of where that was going. Um, and it sounds like rightly so, uh, but she never had an editor later on. And, you know, I mean, there are areas where you could tell where it could use it, but I also thought there's a striking originality to her work that, uh, that it's important. And I think that increasingly that's what I'm grappling or you know, grappling with. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to have the bravery to just really strike off my own and not necessarily listen to all the rules that we're told. Uh, you know, even the, the, what's considered maybe, I guess, axiomatic uh, notions like even the strong and white and, um, and even Stephen King on writing. I think my whole generation has sort of read that, read both of those books. And don't get me wrong. I am not saying that there isn't 
tons of valuable stuff in those and I've learned tons of valuable stuff in them. But I think uh, adhering strictly to any doctrine when it comes to that is really dangerous. And I, I notice things about sometimes when I'll read uh, other or contemporary authors work, I can, it, it seems like everybody's kind of doing a similar thing in a lot of regards. And I think a lot of people have read on writing uh, by Stephen King and, and they sort of follow these things. Uh, people are really afraid to use passive construction at all. And then so you sort of get these strange clip sentences and things. Uh, whereas, I don't know, again, I feel like even if it maybe is seeming like it's too passive or it's seeming like it's not uh, like a modern uh, idiom, I, I'd rather just do it how I feel like is best for however I need to express it and go from there. And maybe, maybe it doesn't work, uh, but at least I feel like I'm trying my best to uh, say it the way I want to say it in the most original way. Oh yeah, it's. It, I I was finishing up some stuff today for um, a submission, and I because I wait to the last minute for everything. Um, <laughs> I know I've been doing. I I accidentally ended up on a couple of shows that I wasn't planning on. Like, okay, and tonight I'm gonna. Oh, I guess I have two minutes to get a change a shirt so I represent that show and hop online. Okay, I'm gonna do that then. <laughs> But when you go back through and trying to edit things, and I was doing my best to try to stay in my voice because, but when I get it over, get overwhelmed, I end up writing all this stuff I don't need to. And then I have to go back and be like, okay, remember who you are, consolidate it all down because you don't actually speak like that. And then <laughs> go ahead and go on. Cause I, I use some of those more expensive words too. Not often, but you know, enough, enough when I get through, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To, to make it, I, I don't know. I A lot of times, even when I'm trying to write modern stuff, I just have a slightly gothic voice. And it's because of how much I've written, I've read of gothic authors. Mm -hmm. And um, like, I, hopefully I don't come off as Henry James because no offense, but that man could describe a cup in like 500 pages. And, <laughs> but yeah, that, that ends up being my voice a lot of the time. Yeah. So it, it's strange when you have like the older voice in a different setting than it should be, but it's, it's what you work with. It's what you know. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I think whatever it's going to be is going to resolve itself. Again, I think you just have to have the, you gotta have the bravery to, to be willing to, um, to chew on it all. And, uh, and not not be afraid. Not only anybody quash that notion that uh, that you, know, you you know paragraphs can be whole pages. That's fine. That's okay. Uh, and sometimes sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but it's okay technically that that you can do that. You don't have to have uh, you know paragraphs of one or two lines and everything has to be quick. You know it all just depends on what the story again dictates. I think. And um, I also think that um, okay. when we're when we're talking about uh, this kind of language, whether it's whether it's you know florid, fancy, whatever, whether it's ten dollar words or whether it's short declarative statements, whatever uh, has the most power, I think, is the most important thing because I think that's what everyone's going for when they're trying to tell a story. Is what is the most powerful way to say it? And if a, a short declarative way is the way to say it, especially for that mood or that tone, do it. Uh, a lot of times I find the mix is really uh, effective because that way you're not drowning anybody in anything. Uh, um, and that, that can be tough to do. And again, that's in some ways, I, I think kind of what I'm trying to go for in some of, uh, especially my newer work, but, um, it's, uh, it's not necessarily easy, but I think it's really interesting. It can offer some variation. And uh, one of the things I've been playing with also, uh, in my work is I, I've been really influenced actually by, uh, Brian Evanson lately, especially his story length. Uh, you know, a lot of times I'd sit down and do a short piece and it would end up somewhere in the maybe 5,000 word range, you know, that roughly 15, 25, maybe it would even balloon to 30. Uh, but reading his work over the last like, year or so and seeing how he's able to crunch down his ideas and his narrative into 10 pages or 13 pages and have it be extraordinarily powerful and strange and, uh, and just wondrous and all this in, in this tight little compact uh, piece. 
has been really influential to me. I've been working on a batch of Victorian stories, which I just finished. They're all, they all take place between 1837 and 1901. And uh, I decided that I wanted to try to write them all within that sort of tight word count. And some of them go a little bit longer. Some of them are a little shorter though. Uh, but I wanted to try that. And it was kind of interesting because, you know, of course the Victorian uh, idiom is, is sort of you know, more balloony and, and a little more decorative. Uh, but to try to crunch down these I, big ideas in, in that Victorian language was uh, was really a challenge, but I found it really fun too. And I love that notion of of um, being able to read something in a whole sitting. Like it's, it goes back to Poe's principle on, you know, um, story craft, where if you can read something in about 20 minutes, you know, you, you have the reader really in within your grasp, really, uh, you know, right there with you, whereas you can't do that with a novel or something like that. Uh, so, you know, Poe was able to take something like the, um, you know, the Mask of the Red Death or the Telltale Heart and really just power punch you with that in that short experience. And, um, and I don't know, I, I find that to be increasingly more what I'm interested in doing, you know, thinking of being able to just have somebody for a few minutes and give them that, like, you know, Stephen King said, a kiss in the dark, you know, the short story. Nice. Is this going to be released as a collection? Yeah, at some point. <laughs> uh, it's it's untitled, but um, but yeah, it's finished. Um, but I, I, it's 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 sort of weird. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just going to be interested to see what people think about the stories. But uh, being a you know primarily 19th century America focus for as an historian, uh, I just really delve and in, dove into a lot of my interest in that in that area of time. Um, you know, daguerreotypes and the Oregon Trail and uh, all sorts of things like that. I love that word, daguerreotypes. <laughs> yeah. It's not used often. It's actually Anne Rice is who I learned that from. Oh. Ah. It was, oh, I can't, uh, I can't remember the name of what it was. It was the story with the guy who ended up becoming a photographer. And there was like a crazy woman walking around the, taught him things like oh, uh, um, it'll come to me <laughs> but yeah you, I, I think you know which one I'm talking about yeah I believe I do yeah it, it yeah. dealt a lot with the different levels of races in New Orleans at the time and if you were freed or is it the witching hour was, no it, it wasn't with the slate well it, it wasn't the Mayfair it was it was a standalone but I don't think it was very much so much supernatural as it was just kind of a look at the class structure. And um, it was somebody who was like a freed slave or was the child of a freed slave who um, just took up photography and, oh, mm. Jesse, hello. I'm not sure. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering I'll, if I've read this and if I haven't, uh, it sounds, it sounds I'll, I'll find it. It's, it's over there. <laughs> it's, okay. like, it's right there, but I, I can't get it right now. <laughs> um, while we have everybody up here, does anybody uh, have any questions for Josh? We, we've got the history, we've got the awesome writing, we've got the awesome music and painting. He's, uh, he's from Ohio, by the way, to begin with, and now he is living in lovely Providence, Rhode Island, where, where I want to be <laughs> when I grow up, if I grow up. Speaking of place, I have a question for you, Dell. Uh, is is there a building called Woodsman or Woodman in Omaha? Yes, there's the Woodman Building. The Woodman Building. Okay, uh, one of my all-time favorite movies. One of my girlfriend and I both is uh, about Schmidt, filmed in Omaha, and uh, I, I saw that building. And I thought it was Omaha, and so I had to say, next time I talk to somebody from Nebraska, I got to ask them um, because. It's a fantastic movie, and I don't know. I, I always want to visit Omaha just because of that. <laughs> I, I, can't remember if it's, I can't remember if it's still standing or not. I, I think it is. Mm. So when I lived in Omaha, it was there, and it was like a big thing that you noticed. But now I, I don't really go to Omaha. We go through Omaha like mm. to get to the airport or to cross over to Council Bluffs where we can gamble. <laughs> my mother and I like to go there and uh, hey Joshua I was late to the show and may have already answered who inspired you to put you on the path you're on oh uh, great question uh, 
you know, it's really odd when I think about uh, just doing art in general. Uh, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, it, it's one of those things where I just have have done it. And I don't know if there, I, it feels like it was just sort of what I was supposed to do. I guess in the way people, some people are born knowing they're going to go in this direction, that direction. Um, whatever it was, I was always just making some kind of book or some kind of drawing. Um, and it always just felt like my work, whatever the creative thing, whatever the fascination was, I used to blend all kinds of stuff together. So for instance, uh, when I was in third or fourth grade, I got obsessed with the Titanic. And so I started making these Titanic books and I was drawing the Titanic like obsessively, uh, sort of like in the Royal Tenenbaums where I think it's Richie is drawing uh, Margot like over and over 50 times, like her reading a book. It's like, that was me with the Titanic. And um, I has had billions of these. And so I made this book about the sinking of the Titanic and I took it to the local library and sort of melded, you know, my historic interest, uh, my interest in writing and then drawing and all in this, you know, one little art piece and took it up and they put it on display. Uh, like right there at the center of their book mm -hmm. thing in the public library. And I remember that was such a bolstering thing. And uh, I'm still really grateful to them because there, it's almost like something that made me realize that this sort of thing was possible. And uh, I think that really did have an influence on me, that moment of them saying, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and they didn't even like kind of smirk at me like I was a little kid. They looked at it and they said, yeah, I think we can put this up. Like it was it was well enough done. It was acceptable enough. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so I think that that's just, again, I, you know, I know that's not a really great answer. Um, but it really just feels like that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I've just sort of followed that. Uh, it's made my working life a little strange. I haven't always been an, an historian as far as by uh, profession. Um, I was in, I got a culinary degree here at Johnson and Wales in Providence, um, you know, 20 years ago. So I, I did a lot of work. I, I ran, a, uh, worked a, as a manager and a server at a Thai restaurant for eight years, uh, I was a luthier string instrument, so I worked, um, you know, making double basses and violins and cellos and setting them up. And I was mainly the bow guy there. So I did a lot of bow rehair, a lot of bow luthery work, did that for four years. And um, so just recently I went back and got my master's. And so now I've been in the museum field. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, as far as creative work goes, um, I don't know, I, I guess it just is is a path that you know again i don't know if it's going to you know make me any money in the long run but it feels like whatever i'm doing whatever i i need to say is the way that you know this is the way i'm saying it and um and they just go from there just keep making it even if it doesn't mean that it's going to uh you know necessarily get you anything i don't think that's really what it's about anyway you know what i mean um i don't know why anyone does the things that they do creatively really i think there's an impetus for it and you know as long as you're fulfilling that i think you're on the right path and doing the right thing i don't know if any of that made sense at all but um yes but I, <laughs> <the> question <laughs> oh one last thing i'll add as far as maybe who put me on the path that i'm on uh i think my mom had a big deal to do with that uh my mom is uh, just sort of wonderfully morbid <laughs> she's I remember when I was a really little kid, she would say things like, don't you ever want to just like dig people up, like dig dead people up and like open their coffins and look at them, like see what they look like now. And I thought, yeah, I kind of do. Yeah. I, th I think that sounds kind of interesting. And I, and I was always really into archaeology as a kid, but she would say stuff to me like that. <laughs> You're weirder than I am, you know? And her mother used to take her <laughs> walking around uh, this, uh, where I was born, Sandusky, Ohio, there's a cholera cemetery. And right now it's just sort of a marker on this. It was a mass grave basically because they had a terrible epidemic there, you know, as like a lot of places in the 1840s when that really hit the U.S. Uh, and so her mom used to take her around to this collar cemetery. So I'm saying maybe it's just like generations deep. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> that's where this is coming from. But um, yeah. this is no great answer. Some little things don't pass them by. Let's see. Sandusky. And Sandusky. Jenny. Let's find out more about the story of the tombstone picture in reading order. Yes, we'll definitely be reading it. Oh, and another, I uh, so. I'm rambling on about childhood. Uh, I, I brought some books over here to sit next to me in case you were asking me what I was reading today. Anyway, okay. um, I'm just going to hold this one book up. I talk about it okay. quite a bit um, when I talk about things. I don't think they can see this. The lighting's terrible. I'm sorry. Here we go. Wait till Helen comes. Yeah. It's a book for by Mary Downing Hong for 
you know, fourth, fifth graders, whatever. I read this in fourth grade and this changed my life. And I still read it every single year. Uh, I have since I found it again, sort of rediscovered it in 2006. And I've, I've read it every year since then. It's a, you know, it's, it's, I mean, really a young adult, it's a kid's book. It's, but it's an incredibly powerful piece of fiction, I think. And um, her description of the protagonist realizing that, uh, she's going to die and what her body is going to be after she dies. And the whole notion that like basically how she says it is uh, that there are bones under her skin. She really realizes it for the first time and that uh, they're always going to be there even when she can't feel them. And I think that was a hugely instrumental thing in me writing dark fiction. That whole notion of that was so fascinating and dark and strange and really a deep, dark thing for kids that coupled with uh, Stephen Gamble's drawings and scary, st scary stories to tell in the dark are probably huge influences on uh, why I'm doing the things I'm doing today. <laughs> so, okay, so you brought over what you're reading. Do you happen to have any of your own stuff here that would you like to read a little bit of something tonight? I, I'm going to do a commercial break real quick. And sure. if you happen to have something, I'll give you that like little bit of time to prepare. Sure. Uh, how much time are you thinking? however much you'd like to do. So what what are we going to get here? Uh, I'm going to read a really short piece, the shortest piece from New Monsters. It's called uh, This the Body. This had been the body, the one he'd lived in, the one that he now longed for, the perfect vessel in which he might have passed a consummate life had he not been felled early barely 40, and with so much left unrealized. He stood beside it in the morgue, this body, surrounded by mother, brother, ex-wife, young daughter. He was an observer of their abject grief. He knew he should have felt it too, as much for them as for himself, but he was detached from them as well as his physical self. Knowing that there was, in fact, a beyond, whatever that was, had relieved the great fear of unknowing. He supposed that a considerable part of their grief was dealing with their unknown, their own unknowing. For his part, he felt only a lugubrious in a nation seeing himself as a corpse. It was larger than emotion, more harrowing than a greatest fear more, more horrifying than life, live burial. He had tried to rejoin with his former flesh. Of course he had. Oil and water, even when combined, will separate. His attempt yielded a similar result, a surface penetration without adherence, with only temporary emulsification. For many hours, he remained beside his former self, observing the stages of decomposition with indignant awe. Then they pumped fluid into him and applied makeup and dressed him in a suit purchased to rot. He looked to himself like a powdered statue, decidedly unlifelike. But those who came to view him stuffed into his metal casket said he looked good and praised the good work that the funeral home had performed considering the circumstances. Once in the grave, though, the facade collapsed like paper props in the rain. In its permeable capsule, the body blackened and festered, seeped and oozed and seethed until he no longer resembled what he had been. And, vigil concluded, he rose from the blackened mole and entered the period of wander. There were others on this road, on all roads, to be sure. They crowded places which in life had appeared blank, empty, fields and ice flows and the like. They stood on seas and hovered like undulating heat waves above the sun-baked sands. He saw them in houses and cars, in basements, abandoned department stores, upon the pylons of bridges. They watched each other, and more importantly, they watched the living and waited. 
Sometimes he recognized them in the bodies of the living, saw in the flesh eyes shadows newly seated. Though they did not see him, they nonetheless seemed to sense him. And when he came near, they fled from him in their new forms to where there was light and others of flesh. How had they done it? He pondered this through the years, formless spans of night slash day, where the world changed but no longer changed him. He carried his experiences with him like a forgotten language, and after an age, he found that his thoughts were beginning to thin and decay like bit rot. So he searched until he came upon a usurpation by one of his own kind and witnessing how it was done, began to search for his new form. The infant lay still in liminal dream, quiescent and open to intrusion. He found its nascent soul floating on drafts of neural ether, and he suggested more dreams. An orange balloon set against the blue sky baked clean of vapor. The child, Captivated by the complementary colors and the balloon's height, the temptation of seeing the grand map of it all, the life that lay before it, took the offered string and commenced the ride, releasing it as it rose, its tenuous hold on its young flesh, and laughing until, at length, the inquit soul vanished. Then he with the last of his dissolving will, lay his fragmented consciousness upon the vacated flesh, and after a fizzing, flashing scintillation which smelled something like gunpowder, settled into the untenanted shell, which had missed not a breath and only a beat of its rapid heart. The eyes opened, the flesh held, but within it, so he had vanished, like that child into the ozone. And so the crime, acted out with impunity, had been, as was manifestly necessary, equitable. Bravo, sir. Thank you for that. I That was one of my favorites. Because I, it, I, I sang before, for some of you that are, joined us a bit late, um, a, a lot of his work deals with death and that gives us three of them kind of in, in different stages of, or at least that's how I kind of interpreted it. Hey. Thank you. Yeah, and you are very good at reading your own work too. There's some oh. people who stumble. But. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I stumbled a little bit. I haven't, I haven't read that one yet out loud, but I, I always try to read slowly because otherwise I, I really trip up. <laughs> well, we're proud to have it on our show. Honored to read it here. So, oh, um, okay. So you have the Victorian stuff that you haven't gotten a title for that's coming out, but right now we're releasing the new monsters. Mm -hmm. um, and I've already mentioned the black book. <laughs> no, it's not that. <laughs> I'm like the black one. Yeah, no. <laughs> the Grave Digger's book, of, Coffin Maker's book of Dark Tales, which I will never get right. <laughs> um, in a more time, and The Descent. The Descent is something else I haven't picked up yet, but I'm going to beg you to autograph a copy of it for me. And I'll, 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 I'll send you the money for it if you can hook me up with that. Because, guys, you got to get into this while, while, while the getting is good. And I'm uh, going to be doing some giveaways tonight. And I'm eliminating everybody who works for the network because you guys don't get a join, but um, from the big prize anyway. And that gives us uh, Jenny, our folks over at East Coast Haunters, and Mr. Mike Phelps. Um, rather than taking the time to spin a wheel, I'm just going to send all three of them the autographed paperback copy of New Monsters. Let me get that set up. And guys who are on the network, don't feel bad. I'll give you something to read while you're hiding out in Pictwitch. Um, you'll get the e-copies. So 
going to get that going for everybody. Um, Mr. Phelps, uh, I believe I need to have you send me something or else I will send you an email so I can get a hold of what your address is. Um, Jenny and Haunters, I think I have yours on saved already. But um, yeah, so is there anything else? Um, yeah, you're going to love it. It's fabulous, I'm telling you. Um, is there anything else you wanted to promote or work on tonight? Uh, well, I have new monsters is shipping now. The signed uh, copies are only a hundred of them. Uh, I'm not sure how many are left, uh, but it's it, it is shipping now. Uh, as far as other work, uh, I have the Anamorta, which we talked a little bit about. Uh, that is published by Weird House Press. There are some hardcover deluxe editions with these uh, uh, end papers that I did. Uh, this is actually an original art wow. piece I did of music that I wrote. Um, that uh, St. Joshi transcribed for me, and uh, this was just a lot of fun. This project to do, and uh, so there are a few copies of this left. Uh, the hardcover. There are some paperbacks too, and of course the Coffin Maker's Book of Dark Tales, which you mentioned. Uh, that it's a signed copy and paperback. Wrote this with the inimitable uh, Curtis Lawson, my good buddy and brilliantly gifted author. Uh, and then. This is the cover of The Descent of the, the Weird House book that sounds like it's going to be shipping to uh, you fine folks watching. Uh, this is a collection of stories. I kind of like to think of these a little more, um, a little more Twilight zone I think. Uh, the kind of a range of stories. These are, these are some of my uh, personal favorites are in here. And then I have a couple of uh, self-published books. I have a collection called What's Coming For You. Um, that is a collection of short stories. This was my very first book. Uh, this is available uh, through Amazon. And then I have a novel called uh, A Mighty Word. I'm so sorry the lighting is so bad where I'm sitting and you can't see these things very well. There it is, A there Mighty Word. Um, this one, the, the cover is sort of, I guess, strange, you'd say maybe for a novel that is, you know, quote, horror or something of that sort. Um, I don't know if I'd even call this a horror novel, although it does have uh, what I'd like to call the civilized undead. Uh, so I guess technically they're zombies, but they're returned from the mid-Victorian period. And um, and they just returned, I guess, with their civility. And they aren't mindless sort of wandering zombies looking for brains or anything. They want to know why the world they left is such a disaster. And, um, and it has to do kind of with that. And... Uh, yeah, I, those are the those are my books. <laughs> so I suppose, as far as promotion, that's everything beyond Decomposer. If anybody's interested in going over and listening to that on Bandcamp and and uh, buying a digital copy, yeah, it's awesome too. And if you go to the link, you can get to all of the stuff that he just posted up. Um, I did see the interview with your brother where you were showing the first or the last two books that you held up, um, but with the and then the Inamorta. Uh, that the story behind how you got that score work was really neat. If you don't mind sharing the full story with it. Oh, sure. Uh, well, that was really cool. Oh yeah, it was, it was, it was an incredible process to be involved in. Uh, the, uh, the novel, just to give you a little background, the, the novella is about a, uh, a violist, the world's greatest violist, which uh, as a luthier uh, of string instruments, that's always kind of a joke that, you know, the violist is always kind of like, you know, not to play on words, but second fiddle or whatever. I personally think a viola is far more beautiful and I love uh, the sound of it. And I think it's a lot more expressive. It's closer to the human voice. Anyway, uh, the... The protagonist in that is the world's greatest viola. It takes place in 1799, so it's a period piece. And he plays on this instrument called the Anamorta, which is this black, very large instrument. Uh, it's been passed down to his family, which are all virtuosos who have all met uh, untimely ends, violent ends, uh, for reasons sort of unknown, although the protagonist knows why this is the case. And he ends up at this castle called Teethsgate, uh, where there's this very strange family kind of living on their own, uh, Count and Countess and their wife, uh, or I'm sorry, their daughter, Deva, who's a very strange and is in, quickly sort of falls in love with him and also sort of the power that he possesses in his playing, which is, uh, 
which is where the crux of the story really starts to happen. Anyway, uh, the viola piece, the music for this, you know, being that I write music, I'm, I'll, I'll have music for things in my head sometimes. I listen to a lot of classical music. And I've always wished I could have been a composer or that, you know, my parents had given me piano lessons. I'm probably the only kid uh, that wished that. Um, but uh, I didn't. I don't know how to play things, even though I've, I've worked on string instruments just enough to sort of <laughs> tonality, you know, make, make the sound. So I wrote uh, this music in my head as I was, <coughs> excuse me, walking around Providence and, uh, you know, came up with, you know, basically the theme for this main character and what this viola would be. And so it was kind of locked in my head. I tried to transcribe it to piano, to guitar, it just wasn't working. So anyway, uh, I befriended S.G. Joshi and he did some edits on this manuscript, helped me with some of the, uh, the, the current the language in it, the period language, which was great. And, um, and then I asked him, I said, I got a weird question. I, I know you're uh, a, a string instrument player. Do you think if I sent you something I hummed into a recording, you could maybe transpose it into a viola piece? And he said, yeah, it's worth a shot. Um, and S.G. Joshi, I just have to mention, is a, an extraordinarily generous, generous individual with his time. Uh, he's been so helpful to me, to Curtis, I know, too. And uh, to even do a project like this, I was just so honored that he even accepted. And so anyway, I sent him this hummed recording of, you know, the music in my mind. And in like two days, he sent back to me this, basically he had run this through like a, a synth thing and, and a music program. And then he had done some editing and fixed it up and uh, sent back to me, which was basically 90% of the piece of music that was in my head. I mean, there were some things that were different, um, but it was, just, it was eerie to hear. And so he also sent me the actual pages, not just the recording. And so uh, I had done a series of paintings called Primary Sources where I had done all these different documents. This was like 13 years ago. And uh, part of it was like I had stained them with tea. Like I did a, a document of Robespierre when they came in to arrest him and he was shot in the jaw and there was blood all over this document. So I did done a replica of that. Um, anyway, I'd done all this tea staining and, uh, and I had done a, a, the frontispiece piece of uh, uh, Mozart's Requiem uh, as a music score. So I had some experience doing some of this. So I thought I'm gonna write this out as if it were a piece of music. Uh, that the protagonist had written and uh, had maybe it sat at the bottom of a violin case or viola case for years. And so that's basically what that was. Uh, I, I took that music that he sent me and and made this art piece basically out of it and uh, and then was able to use it as the, the end papers for that, which was just such a cool collaboration to do, you know, A, with S.D. Joshi, but to make that actual music come alive and to have it be thematically something that if the violist did open that up, and tried to play it uh, what was in the book it is the piece itself that's awesome have you have you had anyone play it for you, did you did no you I, i've i've been talking with some people it's hard to find violists sometimes uh i i do know a couple and i've talked to them but i haven't i haven't gotten uh the recordings yet but that's sort of in the works so i'm hoping at some point to do it and actually really you know put out there a sort of a companion piece uh, of a live recorded version on an actual instrument that would be great that would be if, if you get that let us know oh like, we'll do indeed put links for everybody to check it out um but yeah you you're just an awesome all-around guy you have so many cool things going on oh that's um, very kind of thank you <laughs> well um okay guys uh going on an hour and a half here and need to let this guy go but it has been so much fun diving into your head and getting to experience um well they'll be able to experience when they go to it your music i've already done that um some of your artwork all of your books jenny i've loved learning about you yes oh. and the history you got you got some questions for you need victorian he's got you <laughs> send him a message Say hi. Please do. Um, I'm happy to chat with anybody. Yeah. And, yeah. and outside of your website, um, is there anywhere else that you like to have people try to get a hold of you? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, my social uh, social media is all linked through my website, and uh, so I mean, you know, please say hello uh, if you'd like. Uh, my email is uh, Joshua Rex Art A R T at gmail.com for anybody that wants to email me too. I'm happy to chat there. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say to you, this is just a wonderful show and uh, you've been such a gracious host and thank you so much for, for having me. This has been a really wonderful experience though. So. 
Oh, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you guys next time in a month. And I have no idea who we're having on yet. So send me <laughs> ideas if you have some. If you want to come on the show, let me know. And take care, everybody. Happy Sunday. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Van Samson, Curtis M. Lawson, Paul Christian Glenn, Joshua Rex, Raz, Rob Smell, 